this one. Oh, thank you, Jesus. All right, here we go. In three, <laughs> two, one. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is McKaylee. I work at Tattered Cover Bookstore. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you for shopping locally. Thank you for supporting local independent bookstores. We would not be here without you. Um, not this last year over the global crisis we all have been facing and not over uh, the last 50 years as it is Tattered Cover's 50th anniversary here in 2021. So we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Before I go any further, I wanna let you know that closed captioning is enabled on this video for those who might want it or need it. There, there, there is a black bar at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. If you click that button, closed captioning is enabled should you want it or need it. I also want to let viewers know that there is a chat next to the screen you're watching us on right now. That's where we're going to, we're going to be taking audience Q&A after uh, Anne Lamont and Neil Allen's discussion here. So feel free to write your questions in at any time during the presentation today. Um, and so for those of you who might be joining us who are out of the Colorado area, Tattered Cover is a local independent bookstore located in the Denver metro area with four stores, soon to be five. We're opening up our brand new children's location later this summer. And so for the stores that are open, uh, you can come in and visit us. We are asking patrons to still wear their mask over their mouth and their nose as we do have a young patron base um, who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated and, um, and an older base as well. And so we want to protect as many of our customers as we can. So we ask that and thank you for adhering to that policy. Also, we have upcoming events online. You can check all of those out at tattercover.com slash event. And you can also shop online at tattercover.com as well. Um, if you're out of state, you want to still shop from your pajamas, I 100% understand. <laughs> That's going to be a hard habit from to break in COVID. But tonight, the event, I am so very excited for this event. Um, personally, I know a lot of our staff is very excited for this one as well. We have Neil Allen with Anne Lamont uh, in conversation with one another, and we're talking specifically about uh, Neil Allen's new book, Shapes of Truth. Um, and so a little bit about our guests this evening. Uh, Anne Lamont is the New York Times bestselling author of Dusk, Night, Dawn on Revival and Courage, which was published in March. She's the author of 18 more books of essays, novels, including Rosie and Imperfect Birds, and long form nonfiction, including the classic writing manual, Bird by Bird, and the child rearing memoir, Operating Instructions. She is a past recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and inductee into the California Hall of Fame. And Neil Allen, he is a coach and writer who studies and practices traditional and contemporary spiritual paths. His private coaching practice blends standard psychodynamics with spirituality methods. Earlier careers included newspaper journalism and corporate marketing for a large public companies. He lives in Northern California with his wife, author, Anne Lamont. And now it's my honor uh, to welcome both Anne and Neil. And I'm going to turn my camera so we can see everybody. Hello. Welcome, you two. Oh, thank you so, so much. <clears throat> and thank you, Tattered Covered. It's really literally one of my two or three favorite bookstores in the country. And I'm usually there in person and was fairly recently. Um, but now I'm excited to be here to introduce you all to my husband, Neil, and his book, Shapes of Truth. Um, I met Neil five years ago on Match, and I married him two years ago under great duress. Um, I We met uh, on, as I said, on Match, and at one point in our Match correspondence, he sent a uh, a note about this book he was working on that in turn became Shapes of Truth. And I just felt doomed. I, I was so worried because first of all, I thought two red flags, A, he's a writer, and he probably just wants the name of my agent. And two, the book and the Shapes of Truth just sounded like voodoo, you know, just way more woo woo than I actually am. I'm a nice Sunday school teacher, as you know. And, um, so we met and we have not been apart for a day unless one of us was traveling for five years um in the very early days he, he talked about he was clearly overeducated. educated uh, uh, that was obvious from our first in-person conversation and um <laughs> i'm a dropout and but we'd read all the same books we loved all the same movies we could talk about spiritual stuff although we are, have very little in common, um, except that we're both seekers. And um, 
but I was scared to death to read what he'd written in case he wasn't a good writer. He sure could talk a good game, but so we exchanged something. I'd written an essay recently and he'd been published in a quarterly and we handed it off to each other and went off to our corners to read it. And what he'd written was just lovely. I loved it. It was, it was brilliant, but it was really welcoming and clear, um, which is exactly how I would describe shapes of truth. So without further ado, Neil, why don't you begin by either telling people what the shapes of truth are, or maybe read us, read to us from the first few paragraphs. Yeah, let me let me go ahead. Hi, and Hi. let me go Very ahead. And... Quickly, I'm just going to pop off screen here and let the two of you go, and I'll join you back for Q and A. But please, thank you, Michaela. Take it away. Thanks. Um, I'll go ahead and read it, uh, and uh, this will be the conceptual portion of the evening, okay. followed by the more rollicking portion of yes. the evening. All right. Okay. So, hidden in your body uh, is a set of 35 concepts that describe qualities of God you can experience them. It's as if you discover God inside you. You have the feeling when you experience them that part of you has been hollowed out and a body form, which I'll describe, is floating inside in 3D HD. They feel palpable, not imaginary, and they're not just special effects. Experiencing them provides a sense of well-being, respite from day-to-day -day concerns, and over time can help you land in a life that feels lighter, more loving, and less difficult. They might constitute most of an entire path to enlightenment for you. You just need to know where and how to look for them. Each body form represents a simple and easy to understand characteristic of the divine. To those of us who experience them, they seem to be universal, specific, and valuable. One might be a red vibrant sphere sitting in the center of your chest as if a phantom organ. It shows up for you exactly the same way it shows up for me. It has a meaning, in this case, a meaning that corresponds to the concept of strength. You have that meaning, I have that meaning, we share that meaning, and when either of us finds that same red object, it comes with the feeling that I suddenly know my own capacity for strength. Another might be a dense ebony mountain rising in your lower abdomen. It likewise has a meaning existence. Meeting this mountain inside, we experience a secure understanding of our own inner existence. These 35 embodied concepts, each with its own color and other sensory attributes, don't just describe reality in a peculiarly accurate way. Finding them inside, you can also, finding them inside you can also grant immediate and eventually sustained relief from everyday suffering. I think I'll stop there. That's good. Yeah. Um, because now I'm gonna take the book and read something from my forward. She's which gonna is, read something that's like funny and entertaining. Which is funny and, so yeah. she's gonna kind of top me on this yeah. reading um selection. Thing. That's the hope. Yeah. Um so I'll read you the first um sentence, first of all. A Buddhist, a Christian, a Jew, a misanthrope, and a secular humanist walk into a bar. This isn't a joke, but a description of the audience for the book in your hands. Anyone interested in life, love, truth, transformation, and simply being humans together will find it exhilarating, will be changed and challenged and nourished, nourished by its insights. So I wanted to um, read about our first date um, because it's sort of funny, but also it, it seems to help people figure out how it works, how this whole system of shapes um, shapes and colors inside of us that give us very specific information about uh, what's going on and how to um, stay with it until it changes into something that may just in fact change us. So um, let's see. So I showed up. So I was a tiny bit con discombobulated after I showed up and not just because it was after all a first date. My problem was less romantic. That very morning, I had decided to fire a longtime assistant. As I settled into my seat at the restaurant, I felt down and guilty. Being be me, I might have mentioned this in passing with Neil. I may have. Let's assume that I did. He didn't recoil at the overshare or express knee-jerk sympathy at my distress, 
distress, so much as he seemed deeply curious, so curious that I had a hard time changing the subject. After our second cup of coffee, we got down to the books we were each reading. His was called Shapes of Truth. Writing. He was writing. His was called Shapes of Truth. Oh, I asked prettily, what is it about? Let me show you, he offered, and began to walk me through the process that he describes in this book. He told me to think about my difficulty that morning with my assistant. I closed my eyes to begin the interior visualization. He asked if I felt anything distinctive in my torso, and if so, where was it? I described a cramped feeling in my lower belly, anxiety I had over the firing. Neil asked me to describe the exact size of the area of tension, the shape of the area, its density, and its color. It was an ugly stain, a liquid that had spilled, grayish brown, the density of mercury. He asked me to stay with it for a minute. I desperately wanted to run, but I sat quietly, partly because he had such a cute nose, but also because my stomach felt terrible and maybe this would help. Then I noticed the strangest thing, that the gray-brown liquid was floating in an empty space, as if some of my internal organs had been pushed aside and had left behind a pristine staging area. After a while, he asked if the thing in my belly was changing in any way. Well, not fast enough, I can tell you that. But in fact, it had, it had changed slightly. And it continued to becoming wider and less dense, less like mercury. Then after some time, it rose higher, eventually reaching my chest, much airier now, and then slowly rose up my throat and into the air beside me, where it disappeared. In its place, I noticed a white balloon. It was beside me on the chair where I was sitting. An icky, thick, grayish-brown blob had transformed through attention and Neil's curiosity into a white balloon hovering beside me and then magically inside me too. Ah, Neil said, smiling, you went straight to the pearl. The pearl, I asked. Yeah, he said, the pearl, that white balloon is kind of like looking straight at your own soul or at least a part of it, as if you can see both your own divinity and your ability to function in the world from your divinity. So that's what the process is like. It's something everybody could do with a person who will sit with you and keep asking you questions about what the shape is doing, what color it is, is it changing, is it moving? And if not, that's okay too. The person waits with you for a minute and might ask again and you describe the shape and all of a sudden you might notice that it's transforming into something slightly different. Or you can offer this um, process to a friend too. You get quiet, you sit together and you say, is there a spot in your body, an area in your body that feels a little tense or a little clenched? And I can tell you, everyone I know does almost instantly. It's typically in your torso or tummy. And then you just begin the work. And the work is about listening and the work is about curiosity. So, um, Neil, let me ask you this. Why did you write this book? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, 10 years ago or so, I came under the influence of a, uh, a modern new age guru uh, who has a mystery school in Boulder and in Berkeley um, called Diamond Heart. His name is Hamid Ali, and he writes uh, prolifically and beautifully uh, about the uh, experiences of um, enlightenment paths along the path that, on various different paths. And he's kind of consolidated a lot of different paths uh, through, through his inquiries and come up with a way of assisting people in removing the obstacles of their ego. And I was very impressed by the work. I did the work for a very long time uh, um, with him and senior teachers of his uh, and groups of people. Uh, and um, I noticed something and I asked him uh, by email after I had left the group, after I had left the mystery school, I said, you know, you've never gotten credit for um, having discovered these universal uh, forms that can be found and elicited very easily in just about anybody's torso or cranium. 
And uh, I think that they're uh, closely associated with what I learned in college as the Platonic ideals. And the uh, uh, historians of philosophy and philosophers have no idea that you've done this and they might want to know about this. Um, you might want to write a book about that. And he said, no, I've written, um, I've got other books I want to write, but if you want to write a book like that, I'll assist you as I can. And uh, so I started writing the book uh, dutifully um, as an appreciative student of a true master, a true modern master. Uh, and it was um, at first a kind of erudite academic book that looked at philosophy over the centuries and wondered why, asked repeatedly the question why, if these have been around and Plato and Socrates knew about them 2,500 years ago, people don't, haven't seen them since then. And uh, gradually as I uh, worked on the book, um, I moved it more and more out of the academics and uh, kind of uh, a desire to be erudite and more and more toward uh, an audience and people who haven't heard about this and for whom uh, it could be exciting. And the reason for that was that I had picked up a bunch of clients in the meantime, and I had started practicing on my clients um, uh, uh, some of the techniques to bring out these body forms, and I was recognizing that their lives were being affected by this in a good way. And that's that ended up being somewhat um, more important to me uh, I suppose, and uh, the book became uh, more accessible and more charming as I, I hope charming. As I mean, we that's like an, to yeah. think. Yeah. And it's the, fir <laughs> it's the first glossary or cataloging of all the 35 body forms at the back of the book with descriptions of each form and color and property. Um, and, and the catalog was actually reviewed and edited. That was a primary influence on the, on the final uh, version of this that um, Hamid Ali had on the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I've noticed in, in the years we've been together that you seem to like to write, <laughs> which I don't. I do it because I'm unemployable and because I have a gift and because I, uh, it's what I do. But um, what do you like about writing? Yeah, that's funny you put that. I've been a hack writer most of my life. Uh, journalism, suburban dailies, uh, supermarket tabloids, those kind of mm -hmm. things, uh, and then corporate work. So I've always had writing as my default mastery, mm -hmm. and I've always felt like uh, I could make a living with it, or you know, as a hack writer, not as a, a gifted, talented writer like you. And um, because I was a hack writer and learned it. Uh, around um, um, uh, editors who weren't necessarily uh, Cambridge, King's English trained and uh, in corporate settings, I used it where I was didn't have editors. Uh, I got used to expecting that whatever that I wrote was going to end up in the public eye, right? Mm -hmm. And that I didn't have a... Uh, uh, a safety net under me. I mean, sometimes I did. Sometimes I had a good newspaper editor who who proved to be a safety net. But generally speaking, I could depend on my mistakes and my grammatical errors appearing in um, in public. And it, it's embarrassing. And I would stay up at night and not be able to sleep. And it felt shameful. And uh, but I never had that uh, ability to. Um, do what you're able to do, which is uh, this wonderful thing of letting your ideas just come out as they wish and what you call a blankety blank, uh, a crummy um, first draft, crummy yeah. first draft. I had to kind of have a final draft as my first draft. Be because of that, I think I always looked at it less as um, an art form and more as a craft to just, as long as I knew 40 rules of thumb, I could get my sentences out and I was satisfied with that. Mm -hmm. And I still, yeah. I still write the exact same way. Yeah, I use my 40 rules and I, you know, somewhere along the line, I found a voice and mm -hmm. the voice turned out, I thought I would have a voice, you know, I wanted to have William Faulkner's voice and right. have these deep thoughts that just went on and on and circled back on themselves and brought people into, 
glorious states of depression and angst and horror and mm -hmm. also and those sorts of things. And it turned out I had this kind of light conversational voice yeah. that's kind of slightly um, uh, silly. Right? It's not silly, but it's friendly. Mm -hmm. I would describe mm -hmm. your voice as friendly, but it's so funny because you go off to write something like there's an essay, there's an excerpt at spirituality and health. Is that an excerpt or an essay? That's an excerpt. It's okay, there's a, an excerpt a, at Spirituality yeah. and Health um, online. And then there's, where was the essay published about this book? It'll come to me in a second. But anyway, he goes off to write something. He gets an idea for an essay or just a, a piece that is on inside of him wanting to get written. And, um, and he goes off for a few hours to the Bat Cave where he works and he writes it. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> And um, it comes out good. It comes out sometimes a little bit too know it all -y, which is his um, character def main character defect, I would say, is that it might come out too esoteric or erudite. And so then I'll mark it up and, um, and hand it back to him. And then there might, you know, all of us, both of us at least, and most writers we know usually do about two long paragraphs at the very beginning that are really throat clearing you know mm. they're they're kind of it's like when you have to get into cold water into a lake or something and you kind of tiptoe in and then by the third paragraph the reason for the piece emerges and and the the, the um, center and the dynamic of the piece emerges so i'll often cross off your first two paragraphs and then it's almost word perfect you know the ending is there Sometimes the ending is like three or four paragraphs before the ending you use, although the ending that you use is still really good. And I'll, I'll jiggle things around about. Whereas with me, I write these terrible first drafts. I get an idea for a story or, or a Facebook thing. And um, they're not that terrible. <laughs> wait a minute. Remember Sarah so, sold that piece? Oh, Lit Hub. Oh, it isn't out it, yet. Oh, uh, it that's isn't what out you're yet. Talking oh, about. there yeah, will yeah. be a piece that you will love at LitHub. And if you go to shapesoftruth.com, there are the 34 rules of uh, tips for writing, which I believe Neil just mentioned as the 40 yeah, tips for writing. I always do that. There's I always think I have 40, 34, but I only yeah. have 34. 34, but you can get them at Shapes of Truth. But anyway, so I write something, and it is so scribbly, scrabbly, even if it's on the computer. And, the, and it's all over the place and there's tangents, it's all tangents and and um, and it's just total chaos. And then little by little, kind of painstakingly, I start, I find a lead, I find a paragraph that I kind of sort of semi think might work, although then you probably cross it off and say, this is just throat clearing. But then I'll sort of order it. One image I have that works for me is, is putting beads on a necklace. I'll think of a beginning. I'll try to tell you more or less what the piece is. And uh, as Shirley Jackson said, a confused reader is an antagonistic reader. And then bead by bead, I'll start putting putting the paragraphs on the string in order. And then I'll finally come to the end or what I think is the end. And then I'll write another a second draft that is not nearly as god awful as the first one. And then I'll work with it a little bit and then I'll hand it to you. Yeah. And when you, and when Annie hands it to me, you know, it's interesting that um, some things don't change in life from when you're 12 or 15 or 18 years old, which is um, the the horror of being edited. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I can completely trust. Right. I've got Annie as my editor. Right. I have mm -hmm. nothing to complain about ever about, you know, uh, she can catch things. She can improve things. She can improve any paragraph that I write just like that. She's got this completely melodic sense of how the language works and all the cleverness and brightness in the world. And still I'm defensive and mm -hmm. um, a little mm -hmm. scared and, and hostile. And, hostile. Mm -hmm. and um, I think it, uh, um, Annie's the same with me yeah. when I'm uh, um, editing her work. And we have to do exactly what uh, good teachers did, which is, oh, this is brilliant. I just have a little right, bit. Uh, right. Listen to me, just uh, this little stuff. Most of it's all there, you know. You, you hear, there's a little bit of this and that. Nothing really structural. Right, right. And then after going through all of it and watching her kind of face fall, or she's watching my face fall as the <laughs> number of corrections and changes piles up. And then going, but other than that, it's just absolutely brilliant. People need to read this. Yeah, and, yeah. 
it's funny we have we kind of uh, i and i think this is true of most of the writers that we know mm -hmm. when it comes down when the chips are down and the words are being judged in your face by another person it's scary yeah we both just go into shame and and i sometimes tear up it's just i hate to be criticized i am in the wrong profession i mean i got a review on the last book in the chicago tribune which is syndicated to like 500 newspapers where it said my book it was the book on hope um almost everything it said it was my book was like standing in the backyard talking over the, the fence to one of the kardashians mm. oh so um i know that michaela's gonna um ask questions if there are any from the audience we can go on literally till the cows come home but uh, i want to ask one more thing if that's okay Absolutely. yeah um yeah, yeah people keep asking us um at, at these events if it's difficult for a Christian and whatever the hell you are, um, if it's <laughs> difficult for us to live together. And I know what I believe, but what do you actually believe? How would you describe your path? Oh God, I have no idea how to do that. Um, I've had an aversion to, I mean, I was in the diamond heart path for um, close to 10 years, I suppose, eight years, six years, somewhere in there. And that's about the longest I've ever joined anything, mm -hmm. right? And, and I just, uh, I'm with uh, Krishnamurti, the, the great abandoner of theosophy who, who, who became an iconoclastic spiritual master, uh, uh, international fame, all of that. And his, his central message was don't join anything, don't get another identity, don't do anything that, gives you a name and don't, particularly don't give yourself a spiritual name. And in Boulder, there was um, um, uh, the guy we knew as Rinpoche, um, Changyam Trungpa, who who wrote the, the great uh, uh, masterpiece on spiritual materialism and kind of saying in a different way the same thing. Don't let your mind join things and attach to things as being worthy. So in the end, I'm very proudly saying I am not attached to anything. Um, but in a way, that's not very different from you, since the Christianity that you participate in has far less to do with the church than it has to do with the parables and the stories and, the, and, and, and Jesus and Jesus himself. My, my yeah. bed. Yeah. Yeah. I love that thing Krishnamurti said um, when he was asked what his kind of overarching spiritual um, center of peace was. And he says, it said, I don't mind what happens. Mm. And at first I thought, like, I mind that he said that because <laughs> I like mind everything <laughs> initially. And then I came around to realizing what an incredible, profound place to live from it is. Mm. So um, do are there any questions in there the chat? Indeed, there are questions. I, and, and I'm not going to lie, I could just listen to the two of you talk. So let me know when your podcast comes out. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, one of them to start with is, um, Miss Lamont, if you don't mind me asking about faith and how have you been able to stay a Christian in such crazy polarizing environments? Oh, that's a, is a, I could write a whole book on that. Maybe I have already, but, um, I think actually Neil and I both talk and, and write and read a lot about suffering. We have very, very different um, takes on it all. But for me, um, suffering really is the way home, that the dark night of the soul, as St. John the Divine described it, um, is where I have always felt closest to God. And I was raised in the American way that you just practice forward thrust because the abyss is always about to open up at your feet. So you stay one step ahead of it. And no matter what happens, you pretend that you're doing fine. And, um, you know, and, and, and now in my first inclination, when I feel the abyss about to open, a fear that something might happen to Neil or Sam or our, my grandchild or my best friends is to just get to Ikea and trick, it, trick out the abyss with a cute throw rug. 
I mean, they call it the abyss because it's really abysmal, but that is where I have most often been able to sit very, very quietly with God as I understand God and um, and just feel the mystery that contains all the joy, all the love, all the in love, all the loneliness, all the heartsick, all the everything and experience that I'm not alone in that ever. And um, and so with the suffering of um, the four years of Trump, say hypothetically, um, it just I and the the horrific nature of institutionalized Christianity, I just drew closer and closer to Jesus, and I love his mother. I mean, I'm very you know I wear her around my neck, and I just love her. She's so great. Um, I just drew very very close to what I believe is true, and to not what was being spewed. In fact, this book, um, what was it called, Dust Night Dawn. Um, began as a kind of a take on the great Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel, uh, Love in the Time of Cholera. And I started out by writing about love and faith and soul in the time of Trump. But I didn't want to alienate people that do like and still like Trump, I, because that wasn't whatever what it was about. It was love and soul and faith in the face of terror and not just having a clue how things were going to work out this time. Thank you for that. Um, Neil, this is a great question for you. What was the editing process like? And was there anything that you didn't get to include in the book that you would like to tell us now? That's a great <laughs> that question. That is a great question. Um, well, I, uh, the one thing, uh, yeah, the editing process. I actually, um, I sold this book twice to two different publishers who had two different problems with the book and they were reasonable problems and each time that I bought my contract ba back I kind of incorporated some of what they said and in, into a new version so this actually was a was a fairly painstaking operation and the first I don't think the first um draft of it was bad I think it was an interesting book but it would have sold about three copies and uh what I discovered was that by um, moving away from my duty to my old teacher and into my own life, um, I was able to explore the exact same material in a way that connected better. And I hope, um, but it, it felt more um, direct and less mediated through uh, academic sources, not so much academic as uh, intellectual ideas rather than uh, familiar notions of how people operate and what we want out of life. And eventually I got to a place where I realized that actually I had written a better book in all senses. I, I had worried I was going to dumb it down because that's what people who want to do academic things think they're going to do is dumb things down. And it's not like that, actually. It turned out that uh, I felt like, um, I mean, it's a funny thing, but I like the book more than the first version, but not for the reasons people might think. Mm -hmm. I think the first version was written as well as the mm -hmm. last version. And but it was a lot very esoteric. It, it involved Noam Chomsky and a lot of Plato. And um, because these shapes, the shapes of truth are a universal experience through all time and through all cultures, like Noam Chomsky's um, theory that there was a universal syntax and language inside of us. But I went through it. <laughs> and every time I thought there, a, a little Plato for me goes a long way. I mean, I like a, a couple of sentences, maybe a very short, kicky paragraph, and then I'm good. My, my Plato needs are reasonably low. And I felt that the Noam Chomsky stuff, while brilliant, um, would, would not appeal to regular, like to the, to my family and to our family and to the our close friends. And so, I just always marked it up. And if there was stuff I love, like there's a lot in the book, that has been most important to me about the the reclamation of curiosity in our life. You know, the American way is that you are supposed to know already most stuff and certainly you're supposed to know what you believe and what to make of things. And so that you've lost that ability that a child might have of just being blown away by stepping outside the front door. And so whenever there was something like that, I'd say more, more, more. And um, and then, um, yeah, the first book was really brilliant 
and I felt a little bit out of my league. You know, I felt like um, th I love that this guy who likes me is is so brilliant, but I would never be drawn to a book like this unless I wanted him to like me more. And so over there's probably like five drafts and each one was richer because it was less um explaining things less more explaining relating. things yeah, more yeah. Relating, yeah, more, yeah yeah that's it that's it less that's... to learn as a writer pardon me the, le the less explaining more relating is a huge yeah. yeah more relating and more it's, stories more stories told... of the of his clients and the shapes that they had gone into and just been blown away by I mean, I've seen him do this work with people in person. I usually he's in the back cave with his clients or on Zoom, but I've been at the table with people. Someone might be struggling and Neil would offer, do you want, do you want to see what's going on? And um, people who have the most absolutely most perfectly put together surfaces and appearances would want to, and they would find something and it would move a little bit and they would be very surprised because they're very logical and scientific and it would emerge up here and it would be something, a shape that was so touching and vulnerable. And usually the shapes come outside of us, you know, and, and you can see them or they float off. And people have said they didn't, they love the shape so much they didn't want to bring mm -hmm. it any further. They wanted the process to stop because they wanted to always have it in their solar plexus. But it became more stories like that and less explaining um, what it all means. No, and that's the one, wonderful to hear too. Please, Alan, uh, please, Neil, go ahead. Yeah, the one thing, I, and I will, the, the, the other part of the question was, what did I leave out that I, um, that I uh, uh, wish I could have kept? I actually kept a tiny bit. She mentioned, Annie mentioned Chomsky. I kept like uh, three paragraphs of Chomsky because I do believe that, um, and I, I've talked to this uh, by email with, with uh, Hamid Ali, that uh, these may be a kind of building block, fundamental vocabulary, a kind of quasi-moral vocabulary that we are, that is inborn. Um, which would be spectacular if that was true, because for Chomsky's um, theory, it would mean that in addition to a universal grammar, a universal sim syntax that, uh, that he posits, um, that only gives us structure, we would have content that a, a, a rudimentary vocabulary of 35 abstract nouns of value would give us content. And he has always said, Syntax does not give you semantics or meaning, but these, if you added them to his um, syntax, might take you all the way to meaning and yeah. to having having an inborn meaning in the sense of um, a moral meaning, a, a quasi moral meaning mm -hmm. um, uh, at birth that we're rigged to the good, yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. and I feel like that's true, but for i'm a nice thing about me not being hamid ali and not having discovered these things is that i have no uh purpose in life to prove them somebody else can do double blind testing to see whether no. they're universal <laughs> well, well my philosophy minor heart is grateful for the the references that you did keep and that you get, still get to use in there so we'll, we'll do two more questions here uh one of which says you both make me want to write again after a long dry spell, as I go down the rabbit hole with launching and marketing previously written novels, I don't even know if I can or if I will. Do you have any advice? Do it. I mean, you, yeah. you, you know, if you feel like you've got to feel some compulsion to do it for it to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got I've, I've written things all my life, but until I felt an absolute compulsion to write a novel, I never wrote a novel. And mm -hmm. and I, I think there's a lot of people who berate themselves for not having fulfilled a dream of writing in a particular way, who actually are writing a lot, right? They're writing notes to people, they're writing little, little, you know, whatever job they have, they're the person people ask to edit and to write. And they're not noticing that they're getting a heck of a lot of writing done. Um, but they're killing themselves because a particular form of writing isn't getting done by them. And mm -hmm. they think that's the elevated stuff. That's the important stuff. That's the stuff that, that that is valuable. And I was afflicted with that for years and years and years. And uh, I think you're bound to self-sabotage 
if you're if you have an ideal sense of what writing is about if writing is just something you like to do and feel a compulsion to do then notice that you're already doing it probably yeah um there's a i wrote a whole book on writing called bird by bird which you can get at tattered cover or the library you can get it for free you can probably read it in an hour at the library or at tattered cover i don't think they'll run you off um, it's every single thing I know, but I can sum it up. The title is Bird by Bird, and it, it means my, my older brother was struggling in fourth grade to write a paper on birds, and my dad said, just take it bird by bird. Write it, read about the chickadees and then put it in your own words on paper, just in words. Tell us about the chickadees. Now do pelicans. Read about them and put it in your own words. So you just take little pieces and ideas and descriptions at a time and you let yourself do them really badly you write a really terrible short you write a really terrible draft of a really short passage or memory or vision or idea or description then you make it a little bit better and I, and, yeah. and, and one more thing and maybe it's what i was saying before but um um notice what you're doing to stop yourself if you think you're stopping yeah. yourself yeah. and the Tao Te Ching has a great aphorism for this which is um, most failure happens at the brink of success mm -hmm. most of us fail in something that we're dreaming of doing uh, out of a self-sabotaging notion mm -hmm. that uh, we're not good enough mm -hmm. we're not allowed to do it it's ice cream and we're supposed to be meat and potatoes yeah I like that a lot. The last question that we ask here at Tattered Cover, I think is gonna be a really fascinating one, um, especially how involved you were both in this process, but particularly for Anne, you as the reader, and Neil, you as the writer, but what did this book, Shapes of Truth, teach you? Hmm. I'd love it if we could start with Anne and then end with Neil. Okay, well, um, I had always had, I mean, I've been in recovery for 35 years, so I have that vocabulary and that path and that uh, way of seeing the world. And I am a, a Sunday school teacher and a, I, I really, really, really love my church. I really love Jesus. And I sort of had those two pairs of glasses through which I saw the world. And what I learned from Neil and then from Shapes of Truth was that this stuff was all inside of me that I'd been seeking. And it was all available if I would just stop. Like for the last question, I always tell people, stop not writing. You know, you're spending a lot of your energy not writing. So just stop not writing. And with Shapes of Truth, I thought, stop trying to feel better all the time. Stop trying to, you know, get it to come out right or to uh, mood alter or to, and, or to, change location and just get really quiet and stay with these universal aspects of the divine that are inside of me like i can feel that i can actually feel and see them like they're inside a snow globe i can peer at them i can sit with them and little by little they open up this whole new way of being in the world and of, of a, a whole new way of experiencing freedom from the pinball machine of my mind. But how, would, how did writing this book change you, Neil? I, you know, I've, I've always been a little skeptical of, um, of uh, spiritual paths for their tendency, especially when they're translated into the American population from an Eastern path to uh, present themselves as a bypass to uh, working on emotional difficulties and working and doing yeah. therapy and doing doing work for yourself. And part of the reason for that is that therapy gets a bad name because it's about there's something wrong with you and you need to be fixed. And the nice thing about spirituality is that it says, no, you're at root, you're valuable. You just need to be able to find a way to get to that. Um, you're, you don't need to be fixed. You need to clear away things. And so appropriately, people go into it, but um, I'll a lot of the time um, they're not presented with a path that tells them this is hard work it requires going back into your past and it requires lots and lots and lots of repetitions and what i discovered not just from writing the book but during the period i was writing the book i was adjusting my um, coaching practice and getting it closer and closer to the principles in the book and I and I just discovered, yeah, it's repetitions. It's doing the the stuff I talk about in the book is mechanical. 
right? Mm -hmm. it's, I have a mechanical method for how to like address a particular problem and do it through this kind of quasi-somatic work that I do and and that I got taught and it's all repetitions and my clients have shown me that if they keep doing it and they do it enough times then there's a predictable uh, change that appears and the change is always release you know and clearing away some of that brush it's always about release but these your audience had great questions I loved all of them <laughs> That's yeah. wonderful. And we, we loved both of you and your responses, your candor, your kindness. Thank you so much. There's been a lot of thank yous in the chat so far. So I want to give each of you a chance to remind people who you are, where they can find you online and anything else you want to say before we close out tonight. And again, I'll start with Anne and end with Neil. Well, I don't really know where you can find me online, except I, I'm on Facebook fairly often. I'm on Twitter, Anne Lamott, Facebook. I don't have a website. My son is right here, but I, every time I say that, he kind of grits his teeth and, and um, rolls his eyes, but I don't. And Neil is at shapesoftruth.com. Mm -hmm. And um, and the guy, our, our engineers, Sam and Reese, are at hellohumans.co, and they do incredible interviews with people, very famous spiritual teachers usually, on how to become fully human. But you have to remember it's hellohumans.co, not com, because the com was taken. So that, now you know it, all of us. Well, that's wonderful. And we're Tattered Cover um, Bookstore. We thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for shopping locally. Um, we've been celebrating Shapes of Truth with Anne and Neil. Uh, we thank you all again. And have a fabulous rest of your night. Stay safe, everybody, and happy reading. Good night, all. And we're out. <laughs>